so we've uh, talked a lot this week about uh, metabolic cost and trying to figure out whether it's important or not, um, and that's a good debate. But there's some things we do know, and that is in, in the case of steady state walking, people appear to optimize metabolic cost. And these number of gait parameters are optimized. So if you have someone do something different than those, have them walk at a different step length than they would normally prefer, cost tends to go up. Now these are observed phenomena. And you all know the story about uh, that the, the journey is more important than the destination. So here's the destination, this is where we end up. But what's the journey? How do we actually end up at, at these values? And so that's what I, I came to SFU to work with Max Donnelly to ask. Uh, another idea is that um, gait conditions tend to change rapidly. We only tend to walk in bouts that are less than 20 seconds. And then even for longer bouts, uh, terrain is never perfectly level and, and steady. It's always changing. So given these naturally varying conditions, it would be ideal to have a, an adaptive process that is keeping up with that. <coughs> we're asking, do you adapt to all costs? And really what we're asking then is, do you use sensory feedback? Some uh, sense of metabolic costs, and are you adapting gate based on that? Okay, so there, um, we talk a little bit about the theory that was developed in my lab by Max Allen. Um, and it, it starts with this just the most direct way to optimize metabolic costs would be to sense it and then uh, use an optimization process that is constantly measuring it and adjusting gate iteratively to, to reduce it. The problem with this is that the potential direct sensors for metabolic rate, which I'll talk about a little bit later are relatively slow, and then even then, you have to use them in a process where you're adjusting gate from step to step and only converging on an optimum over time. So a, perhaps a faster process would be to predict metabolic costs on the fly and use indirect sensory feedback like vision or proprioception in order to guess at uh, where the optimal gates are. So the idea is over your lifetime, you've learned the association between energetic cost and walking speed. And I know that my preferred walking speed is 1.4 meters per second. And then I'm walking faster than that. And then visual feedback is very quickly telling me I'm going faster than what I would normally, what I would normally prefer and what is optimal. So it just, I can very quickly correct that and, and uh, adjust my gait. So we have some evidence for this, these faster mechanisms of uh, work done by Mark Snetarse in our lab. Uh, in the uh, experiment looks something like this where you quickly adjust speed and then uh, measure step frequency. And what they find is that a very, very quick adjustment of step frequency and then a very slow fine tuning. And this fine tuning could be explained by optimization, you can't prove it, but at least this fast response is really too quick to be using metabolic sensory information. I think I should point out here is that um, this is a, a very robust finding. So this, we find this whether people are walking or running, whether you're uh, perturbing step frequency and measuring speed, or measuring or perturbing speed and measuring step frequency, or whether it's on a treadmill or on the ground. So it's a very robust behavior. But we still don't know what the sensory mechanisms are behind it. So that's what I'm, I'm after. Uh, but the general hypothesis is that we're using these two systems in parallel to best uh, make gate get, get adjustments find optimal speeds. How are we going to test that? Well, we're going to try to perturb these, the sensory components of these processes. So we're going to perturb the metabolic sensors, we're going to perturb indirect sensors, and then quantify uh, gate adjustments. Okay, so let's start with vision. Uh, we want to uh, perturb vision and give someone the false sense that suddenly they're walking at a different speed than they actually are. And then if they use this information to adjust their walking speed, then we should see some gate changes. Um, so at this point, I'll show you a video. So we needed to have subjects be able to walk at whatever speed they want and provide them with visual feedback. So here we have a self-paced treadmill that's using a motion capture system to track the subject's walking speed and adjust the treadmill speed uh, to keep up with that. And then the visual flow is uh, using that feedback to provide them with the same visual flow rate as, as, as their walking speed. So you can speed up, slow down, and over time you start feeling like it's closer to walking in, in a real life, badly wallpapered hallway. Um, so that's, that's the experiment. And we, we, we get people uh, comfortable with this, and then uh, I'll go back to talk. Okay. And then, uh, so we're measuring walking speed, adjusting the virtual speed based on some speed ratio, which normally would be one, but then in the experiment, we're gonna suddenly change it. So suddenly, you're, it looks like you're moving twice as fast or half as fast as you actually are. And what does that look like? Well, here, here's a case of a person walking mean at the same speed, but in this case, on the right, the virtual speed is twice that of my walking speed. 
So the condition would look we would look like this, where we started on the left and then it would suddenly transition to to the right. Okay, so what do we see? Well, um, when subjects are, are perturbed and, and, and speed ratio, you find that when you give them the sense that they're moving faster than they are, so a higher speed ratio, they suddenly decrease their walking speed, and then vice versa for um, the other type of perturbation. So we want to quantify the dynamics of this, and to do that, we're going to um, flip over the negative responses so that we can average all together and perform some system identification. And, um, and to do that, we, we model the prediction um, and optimization processes as uh, exponential processes that are um, acting in parallel. And then we quantify the, uh, the time constant of each of those processes. But what I'll talk to you today is about the overall closed loop response that you get from these two individual processes. And so what we find is that you have, uh, you get a, a fit that we found with the least squares regression. And, um, and then we find a, a very fast response, and as you saw before. So perturb the vision, very quickly they adjust their speed, but they don't maintain it over time. They gradually increase their speed or return it back towards their preferred that they had before. So the slow response could be an optimization process, but we really don't know what they're optimizing. Is it metabolic cost? Or are they trying to recalibrate vision uh, based on sensory conflict? That we don't know, and sort of to get at that, um, and we see this a lot, a lot of experiments. Either metabolic cost goes down or something goes down, and we don't know, are they actually optimizing that? Or are they, did, are they, did that just go down because they're optimizing something else that is related to it? So uh, we want to get back to perturbing actual sense of metabolic costs. Um, okay, so uh, and, and to answer the question, is metabolic cost actually directly optimized? Um, and this is a two-part question. So the first question is, metabolic cost directly sense. And the second part is, if you, even if you sense it, then are you using it in, in an optimization process? And I want to convince you just that the first question we know the answer to and that, it's, and that it's true. And the reason is because as we're burning calories and burning energy, uh, we have to get oxygen down into the tissue at, at the same rate as it's being burned. And the way we do that is we adjust the ventilation, we adjust the heart rate um, in order to increase cardiac output. Um, and, and there are sensory systems that are responsible for controlling that. So basically we have to sense metabolic rate in order to provide the energy to the tissue. So if we want to know where metabolic cost is sensed, we should follow ventilation control. John, can I, just, can I just ask you, if you get a symmetric response from slowing down versus speeding up the visual field, um, so that could be different experiences for the user, yeah? Yeah, uh, I, I think it, 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 in terms of, the, it was a one model fit for all responses, and so, um, and they, in general, I, I think it, it did a pretty good job of explaining it. But I, I, in particular, I don't know if, I don't, didn't test whether faster or slower had a different effect. But none that I, I was obvious to me. Okay. So, in looking at the control of ventilation, there are a number of experiments that uh, uh, we, we can look at. And we can divide the potential metabolic sensors into local and global. So the local would be uh, group four afferents that are actually in the muscle and they're sensitive to metabolic byproducts like lactate. And the way they, they find this out is that they'll in, uh, go and do it like in a rat prep, uh, add a lactate pollution to the muscle and, and record ventilation. Uh, and then the other set of sensors are uh, global sensors uh, that are chemoreceptors sensitive to blood oxygenation and blood carbon dioxide. And they're located in the medulla oblongata in the base of the brain and in the uh, carotid artery in the AR arch. And they, these experiments are done similarly where they isolate the potential uh, sensory uh, sections and then uh, change the, uh, the oxygenation or carbon dioxide of the blood flow that is going to them. And we see changes in ventilation. Okay, so this is what we have to perturb in order to change perceptions and metabolic cost directly. And so the lowest hanging fruit here is actually changing blood oxygenation and carbon dioxide. And luckily we don't actually have to remove your blood and then add gas to it and put it back in because I don't think anyone would sign up for that experiment. But we can just use the fact that our lungs are exchanging gases for us. So what we want to do is we're going to change the gases that you're inspiring, and that will then exchange it with the, in the lungs, and then it will affect the blood, blood gases. Okay. So uh, now we want to perturb optimization, but we can't do a, a simple perturbation where we just suddenly change uh, the blood gases. We have to do something as a function of step frequency. So if this is the normal relationship between metabolic cost and step frequency, we want to do is add something like the green line here, where we add extra sense of uh, metabolic cost as a function of step frequency, so that when that adds to the 
normal metabolic cost. The, the, the perceived metabolic cost in red has a new minimum. So green here could be carbon dioxide. At higher step frequencies, we add more carbon dioxide to the blood. And then that would, we would suggest that if, if people are using this, that they would take, uh, they would decrease their step frequency to adapt. Okay, so let me show you a video of what this looks like. Okay, so we have uh, some air tanks, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and uh, they're running to some solenoid valves. Here, uh, they're, uh, they're opening and closing in order to mix the gases in the right proportion that we want. And then it runs into a humidification system that adds some moisture because breathing dry air when you're exercising is quite uncomfortable. And then that is going to run uh, to the subject as they're walking. Okay, so here's a, a bag here and that, that we pump air into the bag. And whenever the person removes air from the bag when they're inhaling, then we put the same amount of gas back in, but we'll change the gas concentrations breath by breath. Um, and the whole thing is, is a little loud, so the subjects will going to wear headphones. It kind of sounds like Noah's uh, Darth Vader impression. So uh, we, we had uh, noise uh, on top of that so they can't really hear about their breathing. And uh, so they, they pull air from the bag, it goes through a valve, and it goes through a flow sensor um, into their mask. And then, uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of dead space, and that's a, definitely an issue we're finding with control. And then, but here's what the experience would look like. There's a, a bungee cord that's helping pull up the valve because it gets a little heavy over time in the back of your neck. It's tired. Okay. Okay, so here's a picture of that flow sensor that's embedded between the valving and the mask. And we're using that to measure flow rate and get, uh, measure the gas exchange. So um, we want to control blood gases, but we can't measure that directly. But uh, luckily, luckily enough, the air that you exhale, the, at the end of your exhale, that was the air that was in your alveoli exchanging with the blood. So if you can measure the gas concentration at, at the end of the exhale, it tells us a good bit about what the blood oxygenation is or blood uh, levels of carbon dioxide. And so we're going to have a desired gas level, and then we're going to have this measured gas level, and then use a feedback control system to be constantly breath by breath adjusting the inspired levels of air to get the blood levels to be what we want. Uh, so this, we started with a simple PID controller, and then it's evolved over time. So just uh, to give you idea of some of what the results show that we can control the gas levels and, and affect ventilation. Uh, on the top axis here, we have um, the end tidal value of carbon dioxide. It's in units of millimeters of mercury. So we normally, we measure uh, uh, gas pressure in, in terms of the partial pressures. Not, we're not measuring uh, in terms of the fraction. And on the bottom here, we have ventilation rate. So uh, we let the person uh, breathe normally for a while, and then suddenly we're gonna turn on the controller and then have a, a target end tidal value, which is the red line. And then uh, you can see that we can pretty quickly hit it within a few breaths, and then we'll maintain it. And then uh, once you add the carbon dioxide, you see that the ventilatory response kicks in. So we, we're curbing the right sensors that we're interested in, because we are getting a left ventilatory response. And then the question is, are you also adapting gate on top of that? But you can also see the difficulty then of the control, because the person is always trying to fight you uh, to and, and change their ventilation in order to bring their gas levels back to what's normal. And then you're always trying to fight them, changing their gas to, to compensate. So it's this head-to-head -head battle that um, is a, caused the, uh, a lot of evolutions of a feedback controller that now is trying to predict and compensate for what they're doing. Um, and on the gray here, you can see the levels of the inspired gas. And that just kind of tells you how much work we're doing in order to be constantly uh, controlling and, and maintaining the, the entitled values. OK, so I hope I've convinced you that we can control the gas levels. And then we have a control system for doing that, but now we're going to add a control system on top of that, which is controlling the desired gas levels based on measured step frequency. And so the relationship between step frequency and gas values we call a control function. That's going to look something like this. So uh, as a function of uh, deviation of step frequency from preferred, zero being preferred, then uh, we're going to uh, adjust your, your gas levels. One thing about carbon dioxide is that you can't um, lower their carbon dioxide levels what they would normally have because they normally don't inhale any carbon dioxide, so you can't give them negative CO2. 
Uh, so in order to be able to reduce carbon dioxide later, we have to raise the baseline level. So for normal uh, step frequency, we're going to increase the baseline carbon dioxide levels, and then we can uh, increase it and decrease it from there. So in a case like this where we have, um, if you take a faster, uh, more frequent steps, the carbon dioxide goes down and we predict that you would adapt to increase your step frequency. Now we can also do this with oxygen. In fact, what we did is we tied them together just to reduce the number of trials. And so um, oxygen is going to vary with the opposite slope, um, just like it would if you were exercising. So if, when carbon dioxide goes down, oxygen goes up, and, and at the same, the same slope. Okay, so let's look at some results. Uh, the trial will look like this, where a person will be walking at their preferred step frequency, and then we'll suddenly turn on the control function. So on the left, we have a negative control function. On the right, a positive control function. And then we're going to have a subject walk at a different speed in order to change uh, the step frequency and bring them away from what they were preferred before. And then once uh, their, their breathing adapts, then we're going to let them go and bring them back to the original speed and see what happens to step frequency. So for this uh, negative control function, we'd expect that you would increase step frequency to decrease carbon dioxide. And we see a slight trend there. And um, you expect the other uh, results opposite result on the right. But we're finding some of these very small adaptations, uh, only a, a few beats per minute. That, uh, we're seeing this trend, but it's, it's just very, very tiny. So we're, one, we're one, thinking now, okay, well, is this um, all in our heads, or is this just it's a very, very small response? Um, and then we, so we started looking at the control system to see if we're actually maintaining the gas levels to what we want to be. So you can look at the actual measured and tidal values versus step frequency, and you see it's not so linear. It's not as, as tight as we would like, more blob-like. Um, and, uh, and so we, we, we want to we reduce this variability. Now, we did have one subject that had it almost robotic-like breathing, and it was very easy to maintain a good control function, and then we saw some adaptation there. Um, but that was really the exception, not the rule. So what we really we need to do is we need, in the process of doing is, is improving the control system in order to maintain a better control function. Um, and some things we worked on is reducing delays in the system so that we can get gas to the person sooner. Um, the humidification system now injects uh, water into the uh, airline uh, with a needle, so there's no extra dead space involved with that, um, just like a carburetor would inject gas into your car. And um, uh, we're also having some, developing subject-specific feedback gains so that, you know, uh, for example, a person with a very large lung, but very small tidal volume, will need uh, larger changes in gases in order to affect the, the total the gas concentration in the lung. And, but the biggest player here is the sensitivity to ventilation rate. Subjects are, are breathing in order to fight us, and if they do that slowly, then we can compensate for that, but what's really hurting us is breath by breath uh, variability. Just, it, 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 subject can always adjust their gas values with one short or one long breath much faster than we can compensate. So I'm developing a mask system that uses some valves to uh, mechanically uh, dampen that, but that's still in the works. Um, but even so, we may only, there may be just limits to how tightly we control this, and that, and that given the noisy feedback and the fact that optimization just may be slow in general, we've seen uh, optimizations that take sometimes take uh, days uh, presented here, that we, we just may need to increase the length of trials, you know, put them on there for two hours and see what happens. Uh, or have them come back over several days. So um, we're, we're zeroing in on methodology that we hope to be convincing so that either way we can, we can make a guess as to whether blood gases are being used to optimize gait. Um, and if we can find that, great. And if not, it may imply that these global sensors are not being used, at least on the time scales that we can measure in a lab. Uh, maybe it takes months or years for them, for them to be important. And then we have to ask, well, what are, what are we how are we doing these shorter term data adaptations that take place over minutes or hours? And perhaps it's local sensors that we haven't perturbed, or perhaps it's all done with prediction and that metabolic cost is, is not sensed. So these are things that we're trying to uh, narrow down and, and, and answer. <coughs> okay, so in conclusion, uh, we were able to uh, use vision to show that people are adapting uh, gate speed on the fly uh, and uh, to probably select optimal gates, um, and it's inclusive at this point is whether the blood gases are, um, are actually being used to sense and directly optimize metabolic costs.
Thanks. I think it might be useful to ask the question, what would it take to get a virtual reality system to make someone think that they had just run them 5K this morning? And I would suggest that there are a huge number of cues. You know, I took a hot shower and I, uh, you know, I, I sort of vibrated my muscles a little bit and I felt like I'd gotten up early this morning and actually run the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, given that you're hypothesizing in the first place that people are using indirect cues, and I think you really ought to consider the wide range of indirect cues that we associate with effort. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, one thing I would have liked to do was uh, use audio, and that was actually a confounding factor because uh, as subjects speed up, the treadmill is loud, and you, and you can hear that, that change in frequency. And so you actually know how fast we're walking just by, by, by hearing, and so we had to actually play the sound of a, a waterfall to them very loud so that they couldn't hear the treadmill so it wouldn't uh, uh, mess up the visual information. But we could have used that to our advantage as well and made it sound like the treadmill was changing speed and, and uh, you know, to enforce that, that behavior.
a visual disturbance, then uh, we change the speed, but it recovers the, the original speed as time goes. But do you see any kind of steady state error? For example, does it recover to its original speed completely? Or? It's, it, um, on average, it, 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 it's very close to coming back. And then trial by trial, it might undershoot or overshoot slightly. But on, on average, it was within 90 something percent of, of coming back to the original. Have you thought of trying to use a, some kind of sensor fusion model, maybe a Kalman filter, and see if that can predict on uh, new test subjects the response? Can you repeat that? Have you tried using a sensor fusion model, like a Kalman filter, that can combine sensors that have different uh, bandwidth or response? N no, no. So we used this, a straight feedback model that um, and, and gave vision a, a time constant that, and a delay, but we, it, um, yeah, we're not doing that. So the problem with optic flow as a measure of walking speed is that for any non-zero forward walking speed, there exists a whole size that will give rise to any optic flow you want. So um, because you can walk sort of down narrow hall slowly, you'll get fast optic flow, or you can walk, you can sprint in a cornfield to get slow optic flow. Right. Sort of corn or way. And so this the the sort of calibration seems to be more possibly one of your proprioceptive cues telling your brain that the visual cue isn't actually this walking speed that you think you're walking, you must have just suddenly transitioned to a narrow hallway. The, the, the reason that may happen in your case is because you have the same size squares and so forth, and if you simply speed them up, then you're getting other cues that are saying that I haven't changed hallway size, but eventually you've got to kind of adapt that out. And But you're not giving them a depth cue to give them a real sense of the size. So there's some sort of real subtle compounds that I think make it very hard to interpret the optic flow as giving you a direct measure of walking speed uh, without sort of giving them some other depth cue to know where that optic flow cue is coming from. It, it's hard to tell whether it's, it's uh, actual, actual optic flow stimulation or uh, their sense of moving in a 3D environment <coughs> that you really can't distinguish. I mean, just from perceptually, um, the perceptual experience the subjects conveyed was that they felt like the hallway was moving faster. Not that it was getting bigger, but um, uh, yeah, it's hard to, very hard to distinguish. And also the environment is, Somewhat simple, but and my guess was that if they, if when you have some model of your environment, and in this case, um, uh, I told them that speeds may be changing, they may or they may, their walking speed may change, and not that the hallway would move. That their model of what's happening is more likely to predict, hey, I'm moving faster than suddenly I the hallway just ex expanded. But um, we don't have that perceptual information from them to really distinguish. Quick question about the, uh, the gas manipulation. Um, when you, uh, you you showed the step, uh, this, this brief, uh, this very quick but, but rather brief uh, step step length uh, change. Um, I wonder if the timing, the, the, the basically my interpretation is that's that's how long it takes them to gather enough information to figure out they've been tricked. Um, and is, is there any uh, do you see patterns or any consistency in how long they they modify their date? Like, are they um, suddenly becoming aware of, of the of, of what we're doing to them, or? Uh, this is, I, I thought it was a quick, sort of a quick response to the change gas, and then, and then, but then they went back to normal. Oh, sorry, that that was us changing the treadmill speed uh, purposely, and so um, we so that we start them at a, a slower speed and, and get them to start at a different step frequency, and then um, I guess to try to bring the system away from where where it originally was, and then we bring this treadmill speed back to, the, to what it was before. So all, all, all of a sudden they're, they're at a, let's say a lower step frequency, but at, at a new speed, and then where are they gonna adapt their step frequency to? Okay. Yeah. In principle, are they figuring out that this is a logical trick, or is that some set of giant equations you? They, they notice that sometimes they're breathing harder than others, but they don't um, really <coughs> get, have a sense that it's, it's a function of, of their gait at all. We're distracting them pretty heavily. There, there's a lot of sound going on so, uh, in the background, white noise, so they can't really hear anything. And they're, they're also playing them a podcast. So for the most part, they're pretty in tune to what they're listening to and not really what's going on around them. So to get around your, um, the fact that they can breathe off the CO2 so quickly, um, and at the, at the risk of pissing off your IRB even more than you probably already have, um, people do things like inject lactate into the bloodstream. Um, right. Have you thought about doing that? 
Um, and, and then one more question, comment, I'll add on to that before I give that up. Um, as we saw with some of those really nice posture talks the other day, uh, you can get sensory reweighting, re and there's probably a lot of sensors you know, being integrated to, to give this kind of information. So how do you deal with, with that when you're only perturbing one or two um, sensory uh, signals? Right, like we, we hope that the response will be strong enough that even if they de do de-weight it, that we can see some response, some significant change in step frequency, and then, then it's okay if it tends to go back. Because uh, at least we'll have known that we, we did the, created the perturbation. Um, so we, yeah, maybe we don't, ex in long term, we don't expect ever maybe to see um, a, a, a permanent shift away from what was preferred if we're only doing a sensory perturbation. <coughs> We have uh, one announcement, uh, so don't leave right away, but let's thank the speaker.